Again, I say, Ezra 3, 9 through 13. The King James text today reads in this fashion. Then stood Jeshua with his sons and his brethren, Camiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God. The sons of Hanedadad with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men or old men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. I want to talk to us today again on the topic, No Power Without the Purr. If you'll join me one more time in a word of prayer. Master, we are so grateful for the Word of God. In our darkest hour, the Word of God brings us hope. It instructs us, it inspires us, it lifts us up. The preached Word of God brings faith to our hearts when we're disheartened and causes us once again to look unto the hills from whence cometh our help. The Word of God today is the most important part of any service, any gathering of God's people. Singing and worship is wonderful. It prepares us to receive the engrafted Word. But, O oh God, the Word of the Lord that comes forth must be a Word from heaven. It must be a Word inspired of God in the heart of His servant. And it must be anointed of the Holy Ghost. Jesus, anoint today, God, your messenger. I believe, Lord, the message you've given me is an important message. Oh, God, for the Pentecostal church especially today, this is an important message. But for all of God's people, Anoint the speaker. Allow me to speak with authority of the Holy Ghost. Allow me to speak in love. Let me not misspeak, but let me, O oh God, speak every word in order according to the direction and leading of the Holy Ghost. Inspire my mind at this hour. Speak through my spirit, O oh Master, for we ask it in none other than Jesus wonderful, wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. You might look at the illustration I have over my head today and you may be thinking, Pastor, that's a strange illustration to have in a church service. That's a strange illustration to use for a, uh, a, a sermon uh, illustration. But I want you to understand why I'm using a picture of uh, 
a drag racing vehicle with a jet powered engine. When I was a kid, my father used to have records. They were recordings of drag racing cars with these type of jet engines. And it was just recordings from the drag race track. That's all it was. You'd hear the people talking a little bit and cheering a little bit. But mostly you just heard the purr of the motors. You've heard the old term, you know. People used to say years ago, boy, listen to that engine purr, you know. You'd hear the purr of the motors, and then you'd hear them start to rev them up. And boy, I mean, the power behind those engines is massive. It's, it's the same power they employ to send uh, aircraft into space, but of course downsize quite a bit, or else the car... <laughs> wind up in Japan somewhere, you know, but it's a powerful engine. And when they would begin to rev that engine, man, I'm gonna tell you, you hear that record and it's a and you'd hear that engine just purring, and all of a sudden it would go from the purr of a kitten to the roar of a lion. But oh, I'll tell you what, when you listen to that record. You heard the power. Mm -hmm. Do you hear what I'm telling you? You could hear the power that was in those engines. You didn't have to see the engine. You didn't have to see the flame shooting out of the back of that engine. You didn't have to see a thing. Your hearing alone was able to tell you that there's an awful lot of power being recorded at this moment in time. I'm here to tell you a little secret today. There's no power without the purr. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, you can't have a lot of power and not have a lot of noise that goes with it. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Oh no, whenever you try to employ a great amount of power, you're going to wind up with a lot of racket. You're going to wind up with a lot of noise. My brother and my mother live in Florida. They live in the shadow of Cape Canaveral. When NASA and others send rockets into space from Cape Canaveral, my brother can go out onto his lawn and watch the rocket rise up into the air. He lives so close to the river and he lives, that separates him from uh, Cape Canaveral, you know, he can look across that river and he can see Cape Canaveral, he can watch the rockets rise up into the air. The amazing thing about rockets is they require so much combustion, they require so much power in order to lift that vehicle off the pad and send it up into space, in order to get it beyond Earth's orbit and beyond Earth's atmosphere and into orbit, takes a lot of power. And with that power, there comes a lot of noise. They haven't invented a rocket yet that can be launched quietly. No, they haven't. They haven't invented an engine yet for a drag race vehicle that can travel quietly, that can employ all the strength that it has to muster, and yet it's able to do that without making a whole lot of noise. They haven't invented an engine yet that can be powerful and it can be quiet at the same time. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? No, there is no power without the purr. Now there are some people, I remember when I was a kid, some of y'all are way too young to remember this. <clears throat> when I was a kid, of course I grew up, you know, kind of in the country more or less, up in New England. And uh, about the only thing a lot of young people had going for them 
back then was their cars. You know, that was the center of their world was their cars. And back in the day, it was common for young people, especially, to jack up the rear end of their car. You remember that? I mean, the cars that drive around, the rear end of the car would be three feet off the ground. The front end would be right down close to the ground. Well, you did that because of aerodynamics with the front end that close to the ground and the rear end hiked up that allowed the air to pass over the top of it it kind of allowed you to slice right through and made you able to travel faster and you had less resistance from the front another thing they used to do when I was a kid <laughs> I'm told oh, they used to love to beef up their engines. They bore up their engines. I mean, they would get every ounce of horsepower they could possibly get out of the engine they had in their car. And if the engine they had in their car was too small and it was able to, the engine compartment could accommodate, they would take out the old engine and put in a new one that was even bigger and more powerful. You remember that? See, we don't see that so much these days, but back, back in my day, you saw this. And I'll tell you another little thing that you used to love to do. We had these things called glass packs. And you could install them glass packs on your car. And those things would take the noise of your engine, the sound of your engine, I don't know exactly how they work. I'm not all that mechanically inclined, to be honest with you. But I know that if a car had glass packs on it, holy mackerel, it was like it had no muffler. And as if it had, beside having no muffler, it was as if it had a, a, a system to make the noise even louder. And I mean, you'd hear cars driving down the road with glass packs, you know. <gasps> They'd fly down the road, and my God, you could hear it for miles because that car was so loud. But boy, when that car pulled up at the store, when that car pulled up in a parking lot <coughs> or a stoplight next to you, and you're hearing that, <laughs> you know, that engine purring. But boy, it wasn't purring like a kitten. It was purring like a lion you know that, or at least you believe there was a lot of power in that car because it sure was loud. The louder you could make it, the more powerful it appeared. Am I telling the truth? Now what cracks me up is we got people nowadays, there's a few people out there. <laughs> they think they're going to fake it, you know. They're going to make their car seem powerful. So they make it loud but there's really no power behind the noise. And I've had some cars go flying past me that really made give me a chuckle because they sound like a bumblebee. <laughs> oh, they were loud, but that was what their purr sounded like. Bzzz, and I think, honey, you, you trying to act like you got power, you ain't got no power. All you've got is noise because you can always tell the difference between noise that is produced by power and noise that is produced just by amplifying sound. Do you hear what I'm telling you? I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of churches in charismatic circles. There are a lot of churches in Pentecostal circles. Honey, all they do is make a lot of noise. There's no power behind the racket. There is no power. I, I watch a lot of uh, videos on YouTube and what have you these days, and I'm going to tell you, I'm disgusted out of my mind. I see people in Jesus' name, one God, apostolic churches, and they're trying to make their church sound like it has power. But there is no power. There's only loud noise. I will tell you, you can't have power without the purr. You can have purr without power. But you can't have power without the purr. And there's a difference between power that produces sound. Loud, boisterous, rumbling sound. And there's a difference between a uh, sound that is simply produced by magnifying what little bit of sound you got. Hello now. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you. Uh, 
only a fool in the Pentecostal church is impressed by or moved by a perless, or excuse me, a powerless purr. Only people who are weak-minded and per possibly new to the faith and just don't have a whole lot of discernment, don't have a whole lot of experience in Pentecost, only people like that are impressed by the noise produced in some churches to try to suggest they have the power of God behind them and the noise that is produced when the power of God is genuinely present. Mm -hmm. In our primary text today, the nation of Israel had been taken into captivity by the kingdom of Babylon. Babylon had had them in captivity for a period of time. But then, as is so often the case, while they may have been the bully on the block for a period of time, another bully rises. You ever notice, you know, in our world today, we've got countries that are coming up on the heels of the United States of America. And if we're not careful, very soon those countries are going to pass us by as being more powerful and more influential in our world than we have been for a period of time. Just because you've had it for a while doesn't mean you're going to have it forever. Right. And Babylon had been a world power. They had been uh, the most fearsome society, the most fearsome kingdom in all the known world for many, many years. But then all of a sudden, this little kingdom called Persia, it's the southern portion of modern-day Iraq, all of a sudden Persia began to rise and Persia's influence began to rise and their power began to manifest itself. And before too long, Persia came against Babylon and Persia conquered Babylon. So now Babylon had conquered Israel and taken them into captivity, removed them from their homeland, were using them as slaves and prisoners in their own country. And then all of a sudden, a more powerful bully showed up on the playground. <laughs> and that more powerful bully was Persia. And Persia comes in and takes over Babylon. And when Persia came in and took over Babylon, God was able to do something. Whoo, hallelujah. Ooh, I'm going to tell you, sometimes I want to shout because I know what I'm about to say. You don't know yet, but I do. And it excites me. God could do something with the king of Persia that he couldn't do with the king of Babylon. The king of Babylon's heart was too hardened toward the God of Israel. He didn't care about Israel. He didn't care about Israel's religion. He didn't care about Israel's culture. He didn't care about Israel's history or their nation. He didn't give a flying leap about those things. But when the king of Persia came in and they took over Babylon, God was able to kind of move on the king of Persia's heart. And the king of Persia said, you know what? Babylon was the bully that took over Israel and brought it into captivity. And you know what? Why don't we just make a way for them to go back to their homeland, oh hallelujah, and reestablish their own nation and be their own people? Why don't we? Here we are coming in the conqueror of Babylon. But we don't have anything against the people of Israel. Our issue was with Babylon. You know what I'm telling you now? You know the old saying, your enemy, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, you know? Well, in this case, Israel didn't know it. But the enemy of their enemy was their friend. You hear what I'm telling you now? All of a sudden, the king of Persia said, why don't we make a way for them to go back these people have a rich history, they have a rich religion, they have rich culture. Why, you know, their country is so small and so insignificant and, you know, it really isn't a whole lot of nothing. So why don't we just let them go back and, and, and be their own people and, 
have their own nation once again. And they went through steps. They, they did things in orderly steps. They didn't just say, you know, y'all go and everybody go and, you know, like that. No, they said, what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to send you out and we're going to let you first kind of start organizing things and bringing things into order. <clears throat> well, the leadership of the people of Israel understood how things ought to be done. I'm going to tell you, we got people in the church today that don't know how things ought to be done. Oh, I'm going to tell you, listen to me, children. Sometimes when a situation comes along that looks really bad, and then another situation comes along that looks even worse, God is about to do something. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Oh, when, when Babylon came in and destroyed Israel and they tore down the temple and they reduced it to rubble and they left Israel in the dust and they took their people and they uh, enslaved them and captivated them in Babylon, it seemed like all was lost. But then all of a sudden Persia steps in. And where it might have looked like, oh, brother, are we in trouble now? Because the situation was bad enough. Now it's even worse. Oh, no, it wasn't worse. God was about to do something. You might be looking at a situation right now and say, well, I thought when that happened, that was bad. Now this is happening and this is even worse. God's saying, hang in there. Hold on now. Don't you get ahead of me. I'm doing something. Glory to God. You're going to find out when I'm on you're going to realize when I'm done with this that things for you will be a whole lot better than they were before and the people of Israel their leadership knew listen to me children that the first thing they needed to do if they were ever going to be able to restore the land and the nation and the people of Israel. The first thing they had to do was get their faith back in line. Got people that think, oh, I gotta get my finances back in order. I gotta get my relationship back in order. I gotta get this, I gotta get that. No, honey, you need to keep first things first and recognize when God gives you an opportunity, when opportunity is knocking and you're facing opportunity, it is time for you first to get your walk with God set up and settled and reestablished because the word of God says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things shall be added unto you. Israel said, my God, we're going back into Israel. It's like we're starting all over again as a brand new country. We need God on our side. <laughs> we need the God of Israel on our side. We need to make sure we're good with God. Hallelujah. We need to make sure that, that we show him that he is our first concern and not our last. Hello now. That he is our highest power and not a secondary priority. So they said, no, the first thing we got to do, the center of the Jewish faith was the temple. The most important aspect of Jewish faith was the temple. It was the temple that allowed them to offer annual sacrifices to God for the sins of the nation. Now they could have gone back to Israel and the first thing they could have focused on was, well, let's first rebuild Jerusalem. Let's first rebuild the walls of Jerusalem so that we can have security. <laughs> oh, honey, no, no, no. you got to understand where your security comes from. Your security comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from your armies. It doesn't come from your walls. I'm going to tell you something, you bunch of ignorant Christians in America today who are so worried about building walls who are so worried about funding your armies and building bigger better weapons and carrying your guns for your security you have backslidden you've lost your uh, footing with God you don't understand your security is not in your guns it is not in your air 
force. It is not in your army. It is not in your Trump wall. It is in God and God alone. And until the church gets this truth back in their spirit, we will never see revival in America. And we will never see the church living up to its full potential. You better get your priorities right. One time, the first priority was not to go in and make sure we established our walls. Go in and make sure we establish our crops or establish our cities. No. If we're going to go in, we better go in first and make certain we reestablish our standing with our God. Hallelujah. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. I want to tell you, they, they went in, brought a bunch of priests and a bunch of people who had a mind to work to help in the labor that they were about to engage in. And they went into their land. They went into the place that is known as Jerusalem. And they found that place where their temple had once stood. And there they looked and it was just complete and utter ruin. Nothing was left standing. It was ruin. It was dust. And they said, all right. The work that we need to engage in at this hour, first things first, we've got to repave the foundation for the temple. Now that required that stone be cut and heavy stone, big stones be cut and they be moved and they be brought into place and they be laid. And there were very specific parameters that God gave for the temple. Honey, there wasn't one square inch of that temple that was not literally designed by God himself and instructed of God himself so that uh, it was to be laid a very specific way. They couldn't just go in there and decide, well, we're going to build it like this. We're going to do it like that. No, no, no. They had very specific guidelines that they had to follow. And if they were going to rebuild the temple, then it was imperative, listen to me children, that they go back, oh my God have mercy, and they do it the way it was done the first time. Glory to God, hallelujah. Oh, you old cult, you old Mormon, you old Jehovah's Witness, you old lying devils who try to tell me that you are the, uh, the reconstruction, the restoration of the original church church. Oh no you ain't. You ain't even close to the original church. The original church and you don't look anything alike. And you don't restore something except that you go back to the beginning and you do it exactly the way it was done from the get go. That's right. It's impossible to restore something and to do it in any fashion different than it was done initially. Am I telling the truth? You restore an old car, you don't put any old fabric on the seats that you happen to like. No, 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 no. I have a great uncle who used to restore antique automobiles. And I remember one time I went to Maine with my grandfather and we were looking at this beautiful old sedan my Uncle Virgil had. And he was in the process of restoring it. And Virgil said, I have found a place, I forget where it was, somewhere. He said, I found a place in Canada, I found a place somewhere where they actually have bolts of the original fabric that was used on the interior of this model car. He said it looks identical to what you see here, but the fabric was all worn out and it was torn and it was, you know, messed up. He said, I've got that coming. That's being shipped to me. But when I restore a car, I restore a car. I do everything original. If I have to borrow parts from other vehicles that are beyond restoration, but they have a part here or a part there 
that's still in excellent condition, then I take a part from that car, and I take a part from that car, and I put it in my car. But everything in that car, when I'm done, is original. It was all produced by the original manufacturer. It was all produced at the same time. There is not going to be one speck of this car that is not identical to what came off the Ford lines back in 1929 or whatever year it was. That's how you restore. Well, they set about restoring the foundation because, honey, you can't build a building. You can't build a structure without a foundation. Without a foundation, it'll fall. Without a foundation... It's not steady, it's not sturdy. As the earth gives way underneath it, as the ground settles and moves, then the walls are going to start to tilt and they're going to begin to fall. You've got to have a firm, steady foundation. And the temple God uh, designed had a foundation that was not easily Destroyed. So for, for the captors of Israel to be able to destroy the foundation, man oh me, they had to go to work and dig up and tear up those stones. And they probably had people had nothing better to do than just go in there and chip away at those stones until it was just a pile of rubble. I'm going to tell you, Israel come back to Jerusalem, and before you can even relay the foundation, you got to clean out the trash. I want to tell you something, children. If you're backslid today, if you're away from God, before you can relay your foundation, you got to clean out the trash. Hallelujah. I want to tell you something, American Christian. Before you're able to relay, relay the foundation and get back to where you need to be with God, instead of trusting in yourself, instead of trusting in your government, instead of trusting in your your armies, instead of trusting in your programs, instead of trusting in your elected leaders, instead of trusting in your weapons, if you're going to get back and rebuild and reestablish what God would have you have in your life, then you are going to have to clear out the rubble. Get rid of some of these idiot ideas. Get rid of some of these idiot notions. Get rid of some of these foolish things that you have long embraced and believed that are all part and parcel of the truth of God being destroyed and annihilated in your life. Am I telling the truth? They had to clean out all the trash. God only knows how long that took. Then they had to cut the stone transport the stone, lay the stone according to very specific guidelines. The Word of God said when they finally got the foundation fully laid and they had the last stone in place and the final brick mason gave the thumbs up we're done. It's finished. We've got the foundation. Now, hallelujah, we can build up higher. But we couldn't do anything till we got the foundation laid. Oh, hallelujah. Then the priest said, you know what? It's time for church. Glory to God. We may not have the temple up yet, but we got the foundation laid. Glory. That means we're well on our way. Oh, I want to tell you, saints, it, it's time to rejoice. It's time to get happy. When you relay the foundation, you don't have to wait till everything gets back to where it was in the beginning. If you you've relayed the foundation, you've got cause for rejoicing. If you relay the foundation, you've got cause for joy. All the people of God gathered as they erected an altar and they began to worship the Lord and they began to sing praises. The Word of God said that they sang uh, in rounds as it were. You know how you sing songs sometimes in the black church? We call it call and response. In the uh, other uh, uh, gospel music circles, we call it four-part harmony. They began to sing in harmony, and they began different ones singing different parts. And there is nothing so beautiful as hearing people sing this way. 
And the people of Israel begin to sing this way. And they begin to worship God for allowing them to come back. Allowing them to clean up the rubble. Allowing them to re-erect the foundation. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, we're on our way. Glory to God. We've relayed the foundation. And all of a sudden, a lot of the young people in the crowd begin to get so happy that the foundation was laid. See, I grew up in Babylon. I never saw the, the temple. I don't remember what the temple looked like because I never had the opportunity to see it. Oh, but how exciting that the temple is in the process of restoration and the foundation has been laid and they begin to shout with so great a shout. The word of God said the earth trembled with the shout that was heard. But then you had others in the crowd. Others who had seen, who did remember the former temple. And they said, oh, but you know in David's day when God gave instruction for the temple. Oh, in Solomon's day when the people brought their offerings of all the finery and the good things, the expensive, costly things that were needed in order to set up the temple and build the temple and uh, all the accoutrements that were required for the temple to build those things. Oh, you know, we had so much more available to us. Man, those things, there was so much more back then than we have now. We're coming out of Babylon. We're coming out of captivity. We don't have the same level of wealth and prosperity and blessing to give toward the rebuilding of this temple. So even though the foundation's laid, Lord have mercy, it's never going to be as glorious. It's never going to be as beautiful as the first. And the word of God said these men that could remember the former began to weep and they began to cry and they began to wail. They grieved, they mourned at the thought that this would not be so great and so wonderful as the initial, the original found, original temple. And the word of God said the noise was so great that you could hardly discern those who were weeping from those who were shouting. You could hardly discern those who were mourning from those who were celebrating. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, there was a lot of noise. Well, I'm going to tell you, emotion is a powerful thing. When our emotions get involved, emotions are powerful. And emotions can inspire noise. There are times you go to a ball game, and you, you go to a high school ball game, you go to a college ball game, you go to a professional ball game, and I'm going to tell you right now, them people make a lot of racket. Mm -hmm. They make a lot of racket, but now you can go to a funeral. And there are times I've been at funerals, and I've heard as much racket as I've heard at a ball game. It's a different kind of noise, but there's a powerful lot of noise anyway in there. Amen. Because emotion is powerful and when we get our emotions involved, when we allow our emotions to be expressed, oftentimes it grows loud. And the people of Israel at the rebuilding and the relaying of the foundation, they became very, very loud. People shout and carry on rauciously over nothing more than a pigskin being carried over a white line on a grassy field. And yet we're supposed to be we're supposed to be composed and we're supposed to be quiet as we celebrate the victory Christ purchased for us on the cross of Calvary. Our religion is supposed to be less real to us than a ball game. Am I telling the truth? That's what our Baptist friends will tell us. That's what our Presbyterian friends will tell us. That's what our high church friends will tell us. Oh no, you can't get emotional. Oh no, you can't express yourself emotionally in the house of God. There's no place for that here. 
Yet those same exact Baptist, Presbyterian, and high church folks will go to a ball game and scream and holler like the world is coming to an end. Am I telling the truth? Oh, but there's no place for that. In religion, well, I sure wish somebody had told the people of Israel when they relayed the foundation that there's no place for noise. There's no place for emotion. Our religion is not supposed to be as real. We're not supposed to be able to become emotionally invested in our faith. God forbid we so earnestly, sincerely, and emotionally embrace our faith that we shout or we dance or we rejoice in the presence of the Lord. God forbid. In Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 the word of God reads, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Oh, isn't it funny? Jesus said, but ye shall receive what power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. <laughs> when the power began to come, the first thing that happened was they heard a noise. <laughs> Hallelujah. The first, the first sign, oh my God, the first sign that the power was falling from heaven was a sound out of heaven. Hallelujah. As of a rushing mighty wind, listen, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. What filled the house? Wind? No. Noise. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. I'm here to tell you today children. You cannot have Pentecost without the noise. Hallelujah. You are not going to experience the power of God. We've got a lot of Pentecostal churches today that have told the Lord, thank you Lord, uh, but we don't care for the noise. We are, we've given up on shouting. We're not crazy about people getting happy in the church. Lord, we find we grow better if we don't have people shouting and dancing and running the aisle. We find more people are attracted to our church if we don't have quite so much racket going on. Well, I got news for you, friend. There ain't no power without the purr. If you can't handle the purr, then you won't get the power. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, have mercy. If you can't handle the purr, then you ain't going to get the power. Isn't it funny that the first thing that happens when somebody receives the gift of the Holy Ghost, they begin to make noise. <laughs> well, where there's power, there's purr. Hallelujah. Where there's power, there's purr. Whenever you've got a lot of power being manifested, you're going to have a lot of noise that comes with it. When we read the story in the book of Acts chapter 2, of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. We read Peter eventually coming out of the upper room and hearing people talk and whisper amongst themselves. He begins to preach by saying these words, Ye men of Judea, listen, these men are not drunken with wine, as ye suppose. What? What? I'm going to tell you a little secret. I lived in New York City for 10 years. I used to get on the subway train and I could sit on the subway. It was really cool 
For those of us that aren't racist and who appreciate the diversity of America and the fact that people from all over the planet come to this one country in hopes of establishing their dreams and pursuing their, their dreams for themselves and their families. For those of us that aren't terrified by this prospect, I used to sit on the subway, you know, and I'd look around and I'd see people over here talking Polish and I'd hear people over here talking Japanese and there'd be people over here talking Spanish. There'd be people over here talking Chinese, all on one train car. You know what thought never one time crossed my mind? Never once did I ever look around a train car with people talking in a bunch of different languages and think to myself, my God, these people must be bummed out of their minds. That thought never one time crossed my mind, Tommy. I don't know, maybe I'm just disconnected. Maybe my brain just doesn't work the way it's supposed to. I suppose that the pastor at First Baptist would think that those people were drunk. After all, how could you have people speaking a variety of languages all at one time coming out of a, a, one building? Out of one structure and yet they're all preaching and they're all worshiping God and they're all talking about the goodness of God. But they're doing it in all kinds of different dialects and all kinds of different tongues, different languages. Yeah, first thought come to my mind is these people are drunk. No, not likely. I've experienced the power of God enough. I've seen the Holy Ghost move enough in gatherings of God's people to understand why somebody might think they were drunk. <laughs> you let the power of God come down, all of a sudden they start making a whole lot. They start hooting and hollering. They start whooping it up and shouting. I mean to tell you, they start carrying on and I have people start falling over. They can't even stand up on their feet. People start staggering. People start running the aisles. People start jumping pews. My goodness, now I'm going to tell you something. You look at that bunch of people and you just might think they're bombed out of their mind. Am I telling the truth? So I got news for you. On the day of Pentecost, there was a whole lot more than people simply talking in tongues. Something was going on that convinced the observer that these people must be drunk out of their skulls. Some of you say, Pastor, why do you shout sometimes when you sing? Why do you stop in the middle of a song? I'll tell you why. Because I'm, I'm reading the words and I'm trying to sing the song, but the message in the words in the song touch my spirit, and all of a sudden my spirit says, Woohoo, I feel good. And it just comes up from deep inside me, and all I can do is make a whoop and make a shout. I haven't got nothing to say. I can't even sing the words. Because because it's too powerful in me and you can't have the power without the purr. I'll tell you, some of you folks have never experienced the power of God in that way yet. Yet. Doesn't mean you never will. Just means you haven't experienced it yet. I had a lady in my very first church. Her name was Connie. <laughs> I was 19 years old when I started my first church. I was in southern New England, the community I was born and raised in. I had spent time in Texas. I'd been around a good old-fashioned Pentecostal church that believed in the move of God, believed in the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I got to the place where I wasn't afraid of the purr because I knew where the power was. There was going to be a purr. Hallelujah. I knew wherever you saw an engine like that, you were going to have a lot of racket. You are going to have a lot of noise. I knew that when God come down, hallelujah, in a real way, in a powerful way, that there might very well have something going to happen to make some racket. Mm -hmm. But I was pastoring and preaching to a bunch of people who had not seen the things I had seen, who had not experienced the things I had experienced. Why, New England is way more, you know, uptight and way more structured, and our services are much more dignified. And, of course, over the years... 
The church I grew up in had a wonderful move of God. I saw people, you talk about being drunk in the Holy Ghost. I saw people drunk in the Holy Ghost to the point they couldn't remember their own name. If they'd have been stopped by a cop, uh, they literally would have been tested for being drunk because they were so overcome by the power of God that they literally were just off in another world somewhere. Used to see people overcome by the power of God growing up as a kid. I watched people fall out in the aisles. I watched people fall out across the front of the church building. Oh, I'm talking way before Benny Hinn made a game out of this, before Benny Hinn made sport out of this and turned it into entertainment. Talking about when it was the power of God. But as the church progressed, as the years progressed, you know, pastor after pastor came into our church. One of the problems in New England, churches don't tend to hold on to pastors as long as they do in the South either. Brother Gillum, Pat, he started the Riverside Church of God and he resigned from the Riverside Church of God 35 years later. So... Brother Gillum's convictions and his belief in the move of God and the power of God, well, that held that church for 35 years. You have pastor after pastor coming in, you know, and we begin to have pastor after pastor coming in, and one after another, they less and less were inclined to care for the purr. And the less they were interested in the purr, the noise, the manifestation, then the less the power of God was able to move. The Bible said quench not the Holy Spirit of God. But that's what people do. They quench the Spirit. They literally put a wet blanket over the fire because they don't like what's happening. It's a little too loud. I remember a pastor I had as a kid. He was the last pastor I had in the Assemblies of God up north as a teenager. And one time I went up there visiting from Texas. And there was a young woman at the altar who had a very serious neurological condition of some sort and she had a lot of ticks and things and her little head just flopped around, bless her heart. And she went up for prayer that God could touch her and heal her. And my great aunt was there. She's from Riverside Church. And I was there. And we began to pray for this girl. And I mean to tell you, I began to feel the Spirit of the Lord. And my aunt began to feel the power of God. And before too long, we were starting to get happy. We were feeling, oh, we were praying this girl through to a miracle. And all of a sudden, that pastor began to literally pray very loudly. Lord, give us a quiet spirit. Oh, God, give us a quiet spirit. Couldn't handle the purr. Well, honey, when you put the purr out, you put the power out. We weren't purring to make noise. We were purring because we were getting in touch with the power. Well, that little church I grew up in, you know, it had died. My God, it had become a glorified Baptist church by the time I was a teenager. Still is to this day. They may be closer to something even deader than a Baptist church these days. I'm not sure. But that church is so dead. Every time I try to visit it, honestly, I get disgusted out of my mind. Because what used to be a place where the power of God would flow like a mighty river today, it is just a dead old dry pile of manure. But it's got more people now than it's ever had before. So here I am pastoring my first church. Connie and these people, they hadn't seen God move like I've seen God move. They don't understand shouting and dancing and leaping and running the aisles the way I understand it. But I'm preaching and I said something, I don't know what I said. All of a sudden, Connie jumped up off of her seat. I'll, I'll never forget as long as I live. She jumped up off her seat and she began to dance and shout. Woo! And she, I mean, just shout. Woo! This woman never seen this a day in her life. Because there's no such thing as the power without the purr. Hallelujah. <laughs> You see, the thing I love about God is 
I don't stand here and pray, oh God, make the people shout. Oh God, make the people dance. Oh God, let this happen or let that happen. No, what I pray is, oh God, make yourself real. Reveal yourself in a powerful way, in a wonderful way. Make yourself real in this place. Every church I've ever preached in, every evangelistic service I've ever preached, that has been my prayer. God, make yourself real real and over and over and over again I have seen people do things <laughs> that I never dreamed in a million years they'd do I've seen people let out with shouts and start running the aisles and dancing under the anointing and direction of the Holy Ghost and if you'd have asked them if they ever in their lifetime would do that they'd have looked you and I said never no way no how will you ever see me acting like that but the problem is they're not anticipating the day when God touches them in such a powerful way that all of a sudden they find out they know power without the prayer. I told you the story. I'm trying to close up today, but I told you the story of my first visit to Riverside Church of God. I used to feel the Holy Ghost when I'd be in my room at my parents' house. I'd be praying in my room. I'd be watching PTL and there'd be somebody up there singing a song and I'd feel the Holy Ghost and there was a time or two when I kind of danced a little. But I never in my life had danced in church. Never in my life had I danced in the Spirit in the church house. No, 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 no. Our church, by the time I was a teenager, our church so dead, that would have been, I'd probably been thrown out. But I walked into Riverside Church of God the very first Sunday I'd ever been there. Never had been in that church a day in my life. Didn't know anything about the church other than what my aunt had told me. It was her church for many, many years. I walked through the door, and the first thing Tommy I felt when I walked through the door of that building, I'll never forget it, I lived to be a thousand. I felt this liberty, like I've never felt liberty in my life. I, I can't even explain it to you. You would think that, well, don't you feel free everywhere you are? Don't you always kind of have a sense of freedom? No. Everywhere you go, you've got certain restrictions on you. If nowhere else in your mind, am I telling the truth? You walk into your job place, you don't act in your job place like you do at home. You're not going to respond or react to things at your job the way you react to them at the house. No, because you know you're in a different environment. I've got to act professional. I've got, you know what I'm saying? So there's a certain amount of restriction on us everywhere we go. And every church I'd ever been to up home, uh, and more and more it was getting into the place where you walked into the church and you had all these restrictions on you. So even as you worshiped, well, I can go this far. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I can say amen when the preacher preaches. Woo! Wow. But I walked into Riverside and all of a sudden it was like every restriction in my brain just dropped, fell to the floor, literally. And I couldn't explain it. I said, my God, I've never felt such... I just... <laughs> I felt this liberty. It was like being in the weightlessness of space. Went down to my seat in the pew. I sat down and we began to sing. And all I could feel was this liberty, this freedom. And they began to sing an old song I'd never heard in my life before. I've left the old paths I traveled so long. I'm happy, redeemed, and free. Of Jesus, my Lord, I sing a sweet song. His love lights the way for me. His love lights the way I travel today. I'm shouting the victory. Well, you know, growing up as a kid, we always sang songs talking about how we're shouting. But I never saw anybody shout. They sang that song, then they sang the second verse. By the time they got to the third verse, 
I was flying higher than a kite. Oh, those words just going through me, they were touching me in a way that no words had ever touched me before because I had this liberty. I, I, I wasn't restricted. I don't know how to explain it, but even the words of the song were touching my spirit differently. Oh, I could feel the words. I wasn't just hearing them. I could feel them in my spirit. They begin to sing verse 3, The pleasures of sin no more I desire, no good in them now I see. The Spirit has set my being on fire. Woo, glory. His love lights the way for me. Tell me, I jumped up on my feet and I started shouting and dancing all over the play all over the pew I mean I'm in the middle of the pews and I'm dancing and I'm shouting and I'm dancing I'm the only person in the whole church doing it I didn't care I wouldn't I was no more mindful of what they were doing than I was mindful of anything I was lost in my own world you can't have the power without the purr hallelujah that was the first time that God by the Holy Ghost was able to touch me in such a real way. God made himself real to me that day like he had never made himself real to me in my life. And you can't have the power without the purr. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. And I'm telling you, I begin to purr. Woo! Say, Pastor, I don't understand how come when you're singing sometime, you stop singing and just shout. Honey, I'm telling you, it's because I'm not just singing words. I can't just sing words. When I'm worshiping God, the Bible said God seeks people who will worship Him in spirit, in spirit, in spirit. He don't want your lips worshiping Him. He doesn't want your head worshiping Him. He doesn't want you worshiping Him intellectually. He wants you worshiping Him from within your spirit. He wants your spiritual man to worship Him. Well, let me tell you a little secret. Your spiritual man don't worship the way your natural man does. Your spiritual man doesn't have the same restrictions on him that your natural man does. But what happens for a lot of people is they allow their natural man to pull in. The Bible said that the spirit of the prophet is subject unto the prophet. That means whatever's going on in your spirit... You have a certain amount of control as to whether or not you can let that out and let it express itself physically through your physical man. God don't just come. I know a lot of people have these mistaken notions. You know, the Holy Ghost comes and just grabs you and shakes you loose and makes you, makes you dance around like, you know, a Muppet on a string. That's not how it works, folks. No, no. The Holy Ghost will touch your spirit in a powerful, wonderful way, and you'll sense something in your spirit, and when your spirit reacts to it, now you can either allow that to then flow out, or you can hold it in and kind of put constraints on it. But the Bible said, quench not the Holy Spirit of God. You're not supposed to quench it. God don't want you to quench it. Because the whole idea is he wants you to worship him in spirit. He wants you to allow. And you don't know the benefits of allowing your spirit to worship. I'm going to tell you what a difference it makes. I've gone through weeks that were hell on wheels. And then that Sunday going to church and the Spirit of God has touched me in a powerful way. I shouted and danced all over that church house. And all of a sudden everything I went through that week just melted away like butter under a hot sun. You can't have Pentecost without the noise. Everywhere there is power, there is noise. Thunder and lightning are accompanied by noise. Even wind creates noise. Turbines create noise. Many in the church today want the power of God. They want the power of Pentecost but they don't want the noise that comes with it. So called Pentecostals welcome healings and miracles. Oh Lord you can heal. You can perform miracles in the midst of us and they seldom see them. Why? 
Because they don't want the shouting and the demonstration of the Holy Ghost that comes with the power of God. And you can't have the power without the purr. But where the power goes, the noise goes with it. In Acts 4.31, trying to pull this together right now, I'm running a little late. Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. Brother Richard King was a faithful, devout, godly man in the church I grew up in. Brother King, oh, I admired him. I, I, oh, he was a wonderful, godly man. Absolutely one of the most spiritual, godly men I ever knew. Brother King told me the story one time. He said, Chuck, when my grandmother, when I was a kid, my grandmother was a Quaker. This is going back to the earliest part of the 19th, uh, 20th century, the earliest part of the 1900s. He said, my grandmother was a Quaker. He said, but her little congregation of friends they used to call they still call themselves the society of friends that's what the Quakers refer to themselves as he said her little congregation experienced an outpouring of the Holy Ghost and they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance they had a Pentecost at the turn of the century he said when I was a kid they'd have prayer meetings he said at homes, and he said, I literally have been in prayer meetings in people's homes. He said where the people would get to praying, and all of a sudden they'd get to worshiping God and speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God giving the utterance. He said, and you could feel the power of God in that building. You could feel the power of God in that house like you were plugged into an electric socket. He said, my God, it just overwhelmed you. He said, I was just a kid. He said, all of a sudden the whole house began to shake. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. He said the walls would literally be vibrating. He said back in those days, a lot of houses still had uh, oil lamps on the wall. He said, I'd sit there and watch that oil lamp go up, 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 <laughs> against the wall. He said, when I read that story in the book of Acts about them praying until the house shook, he said, I've been there. I've seen it. You can't have the power without the power. In Acts chapter 16, verses 26, excuse me, 25 and 26, Paul and Silas are in prison for preaching the word of God. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened. And everyone's, not just Paul and Silas's, everyone's bands were loosed. Every prisoner in that prison at that moment was free. So that the people, excuse me, uh, and everyone's bands were loosed. Can't have the power without the purr. When the power of God manifests itself, honey, you're going to have an earthquake, you're going to have a riot, you're going to have some noise, you're going to have some shouting, you're going to have some dancing, you're going to have some rejoicing. But you can't have the power without the purr. In our primary text today, I read to you of the children of Israel celebrating some and others were grieving at the restoration of the foundation for the temple. But the last verse 
in that passage, Ezra chapter 3, verses 9 through 13. Verse 13 says, some were weeping, some were crying. Said so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. I want to tell you, us Pentecostal people, we don't shout, at least those of us, I'm not talking charismatics, I'm talking Pentecostal people that know the Word of God and understand the Spirit of God and the power of God. We don't shout. Folks, I don't get up here and shout just to be shouting. If I wanted to shout just to be shouting, then I'd shout every Sunday at every word of every song. But I don't do that. I shout when I feel the power of God. I feel the power. I may sing the same song a thousand times, but there may be one Sunday when the message and the words of that song hit me all of a sudden because at that moment in time, I need that exact message. You follow what I'm telling you? And the power of God hits me. It strikes my spirit as I'm seeing and reading and singing those words. So you don't see us up here manufacturing a shout. You don't see us trying to make you believe there's power here by creating a noise. But where the power is, there's going to be a purr. Wherever the power of God is manifested, there is a great noise. You cannot have the power of a jet and not have the noise of a jet engine. Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Glory to God.